Next uh, topic is Bayesian optimization, and let's uh, let's start. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Katya Naskola, uh, and I'm also from Itmo University in St. Petersburg, as Nikita. Uh, and I will tell you about application of Bayesian optimization for uh, by informatician problem uh, that is uh, demographic history inference. It will be uh, like more application than theoretical results. Uh, so I guess that you can just relax and see a lot of nice pictures. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, I will tell you about uh, how I applied uh, such algorithms as Bayesian optimization on practice for my problems. Uh, first of all, I will uh, tell some introduction uh, for bioinformatics, uh, especially I will tell you about demographic history and what is demographic inference. Uh, and uh, so let's start. Mm. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't working. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. No. Okay. Uh, so let us start from a uh, definition of demographic history. First, I will show some uh, movie about. Uh, populations, as demographic history is uh, the history of populations. And let's uh, look at some population. It's like funny bunnies, and we uh, want to see what happens with them, what happens uh, in the field where they are grassing. And for example, their, the size of their population can grow. Uh, they can be greater than one, two, and so on. Uh, they gain some mutations and uh, their code can change color. Then uh, someday some geographical barrier can happen and it will separate these two populations now and they will develop independently. Then another day, some bunny uh, decided to move from one population to another uh, through this geographical barrier, and that event will be called migration. And such history, like describing like that, will be called the demographic history. Uh, but there is some like formal, uh, formal definition of it. Well, let's move forward. Uh, demographic history is the history of evolution and development of populations that includes such parameters as size of population, uh, time of split, uh, migration rates. Uh, sometimes it's more, uh, for example, selection rates uh, or inbreeding rates, but uh, examples that I will show you today includes only these several parameters. Uh, and uh, as I will show uh, you a lot of examples, I first of all, I want to show some picture of demographic history that was all, already on the previous slide, but uh, now I will uh, stop uh, exactly um, on this. Um, this is a picture of demographic history for three populations of modern human. Um, and we can see on the right there is a three. There are three populations from Africa, Europe, and Asia, uh, and uh, we can see them on the right. On x-axis there is uh, time. Uh, on the left it is past. On the right it is nowadays, and uh, a zero corresponds to now. Uh, so we can see that uh, our populations are observed uh, nowadays, right now, and uh, it is uh, populations from uh, uh, like our neighbors. Uh, then uh, the 
uh, blue areas, they correspond to the size of populations and the uh, height of each uh, area uh, determines uh, the size. But uh, it is uh, very messy when people uh, put uh, all numbers of, popul of population sizes on the picture. So usually uh, there is like uh, on uh, on the top of the picture, there is one bar that uh, shows the size of common ancestor population that is on the left side of the picture. I, I can show with my mouse. Uh, so this size, like 7,000 individuals, is corresponding to this height, this size of ancestral population. And we can see that at some point of time, uh, around 200,000 years ago, uh, the size of this population uh, increased like twice, some, somewhat like that, and uh, was constant till uh, around uh, 1,500 uh, thousand years ago. And at that point of time happened split uh, this population was divided into two, and the first one subpopulation uh, happened to be uh, our African uh, population right now, and the other one was common ancestor population for Europe and Asian, so we can call it like uh, Europe-Asian population. Mm, and uh, this population also split uh, into two populations that had exponential growth of its size uh, in the nearest past. The last thing that is pictured on this plot is migration, that is uh, arrows between populations. Um, it, uh, if arrow is bold, then it means that a uh, greater number of individuals uh, move from one population to another each generation. So we can see that after the first split, migration was higher, uh, and uh, after some time, it became a uh, lower rate, got lower rate. Uh, so all pictures that I uh, will show you today will be like that. Uh, if you have some questions about how it is pictured, you can ask them right now or, or no. <laughs> okay. Uh, why we want to know uh, demographic history, what uh, it can, what information can, can it give uh, to us? Uh, the first uh, application is uh, to understand population history, uh, but uh, we want to get this information, some other information, uh, united and uh, no more. Uh, in that uh, one example, uh, which is uh, widely used, is that uh, we can build a map uh, where we'll, we show how populations moved all over the world. Uh, here, the colors correspond to the populations, so we see that African population was uh, taken from here, uh, Asian population was taken from here, uh, no, Europe from here, and Asia from here. And uh, we know this uh, demographic history, but demographic history actually uh, itself, it uh, don't, doesn't give us information about uh, geographic location. We don't know it from this uh, information, but we can uh, find some archeological data and we know where we have found it. And so we will know some locations. <laughs> And uh, according, for, for example, according to archaeological data, uh, human populations moved uh, originally were, uh, in Africa, and they moved for, from Africa like that. Uh, and uh, we know it from uh, our archaeological data, but we can uh, take a look at the demographic history and uh, date some events of uh, migrations, uh, for example, when 
uh, people leave Africa when they split uh, to go and one part go to the Europe and another to the Asia and so on. Uh, this is very simple example, uh, but uh, there are a lot of such maps and they have different times of events and uh, they also include uh, the movements to, um, to America, to Australia, and so on. Um, another application of uh, demographic history is conservation biology studies, when we have some endangered species that we want to save. Uh, and for example, we have some uh, dama gazelles, and we uh, want to be sure that they are endangered, for example. We uh, see that uh, right now there are not a lot of them, and the size uh, of uh, the populations of the species uh, increased in the last uh, years, but uh, maybe it is the usual uh, the usual situation for them. We, we don't know, we want to be sure. And we can construct the demographic history and see uh, that here is two populations of Dama gazelles, Mhor and Adra. Mhor is from Africa and Adra is from USA, uh, USA population. And we see that both of these populations experience some uh, decline of population size. Uh, especially the population from Africa, uh, so we can uh, be sure that it is endangered species and we want to save them. How did they go from Africa? Uh, <laughs> it's a very tricky question. Uh, uh, there were some uh, uh, biologists that want to save them and they just took uh, a lot of individuals from uh, Africa and uh, shipped them to USA and they, so yeah. Uh, yeah. At least there is, there was also an old ship that was, I'm not sure, what, what is the same uh, continent or it's older? Which, which time scale the larger, geological or biological? Yeah. <laughs> Well, 2080, yeah, 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 this for sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, demographic histories can have some uh, arrows, so I think it will be probably like an arrow of uh, split time. Uh, mm? They could, yeah, like people. Yeah, <laughs> potentially. Uh, I, I, I don't remember it. Um, and so the reconstruction of demographic histories is called demographic inference. It's like uh, some name of it. And uh, it has a uh, like common uh, shim of it. We get our populations, usually we uh, take some individuals uh, that are right now, that we can see right now. Uh, sometimes uh, some ancient DNA is used, uh, some ancient samples are used, but uh, it is like most likely a special case of that. Uh, so we will talk uh, only about populations uh, that we can see right now. Then uh, the genetic information, the DNA is extracted, and uh, from this genetic information, we reconstruct demographic history. All of that is called demographic inference. Uh, there are several methods, several tools uh, for demographic inference, but almost all of them have a common pipeline uh, so I, first of all, I will show you this common pipeline, how almost all tools for demographic inference work. Uh, we have genetic data, which is uh, sometimes full genome data. Uh, sometimes it is some part, some uh, what we have sequence. So we, we can use a lot uh, different of information, but uh, 
it should be some information about DNA uh, and so on. Uh, another uh, input that we have for our problem is parameterized model of demographic history. Ideally, this model is chosen by some algorithm that, for example, uh, choose uh, from a lot of models and or try several of them and so on. It should be some like clever algorithm for that. Uh, but unfortunately, most tools, most methods uh, assume that this model is chosen by the researcher. Uh, it's not a very good thing as a researcher can have some very strict bias, uh, but it's how it is working in most cases right now. Uh, genetic data, especially if it is a whole genome data, is very uh, large, uh, very a lot of information, and it is very difficult to um, analyze it. So uh, this data is usually uh, summarized, and some statistics are built from this data just to make it simpler to work with. And uh, here's one example. I will not tell you right now about uh, these statistics, but if you are interested, uh, I can tell you after my talk uh, about uh, what statistics are used for that purposes. Uh, and then when we have our data statistics and model, uh, we uh, begin our pipeline uh, from the first step. On the first step, we choose some uh, candidate parameters for our model. Uh, it uh, sometimes requires, again, some information from the user, uh, from, from the researcher. Uh, in worst case, but uh, sometimes it can be chosen by some algorithm. And then uh, there is a part, like unit or another unit in this uh, pipeline that is called simulator. Uh, it simulates some data. It took uh, our model and parameters and uh, simulates something. Uh, and what it simulates, I will show some example on the next slide. Uh, and the last, uh, like the third iteration of pipeline is that we uh, compare this simulation with our data statistics that we have from real data. And we got some measure or, for example, of similarity between a simulation and uh, real data and uh, know how uh, well these uh, candidate parameters are for our data. And then we repeat this process for a lot of times. Uh, and at the end, we got some uh, like called demographic history, but uh, we got some very good parameter values for our model. Uh, and this uh, pipeline has, uh, uh, as I said, uh, some um, problems uh, also. Uh, and I want to uh, pay attention that uh, there are like two units. First one is that choice choose uh, some candidate parameter values, and it is uh, exactly optimization algorithm. And the other part is simulation. Uh, and all tools, all methods, they have simulation part and optimization part. Uh, but from the specific uh, specification of this problem, uh, almost all authors of methods, they uh, pay mm, a lot of attention to simulation part, as it is the most interesting and the most difficult, maybe, problem for this kind of task. But they, and they use some classical uh, optimization uh, algorithm from Python or from, from uh, other papers, and they, don't usually care about optimization. But this part is also very important, as if optimization is not good, then we will get not very not a reliable result at the end. Uh, example of uh, some method for demographic inference is uh, the most popular right now uh, tool. It's called DADI. 
uh, it stands for diffusion approximation for demographic inference. And as we can see, there is mm, diffusion at the name and it, it should be there uh, because when we have we have a demographic history, it is a demographic it is a model of demographic history plus parameter values. And uh, we got our second input as uh, 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 some statistic. Here it is called AFS. It is one example of this statistics. Uh, and then for demographic uh, history, uh, Daddy built some partial differential equation that is actually diffusion equation. And uh, from the solution of this equation, it is possible to build expected statistic. And when we got some expectation and observation, we can uh, compute some likelihood. So the measure of similarity for Daddy and uh, for another uh, tool that I will talk today is uh, the measure of uh, likelihood, usually log likelihood. Uh, as uh, optimization uh, algorithm, Daddy uses a local search algorithm that are not very efficient as uh, they need, they require some choice of parameter values at the beginning and uh, they don't work very well uh, for the global search as we need it. So uh, in 2020, we uh, published a paper about uh, our new tool, GADMA, uh, and uh, yeah, it stands for genetic algorithm for demographic model analysis. And as we see from the name, we paid a lot of attention to genetic algorithm. So it is an algorithm for optimization. Uh, GADMA divides the part that uh, stands for uh, simulation and part for optimization. Uh, so it is possible to choose uh, simulation engines uh, like Daddy and the second one, Moments. Uh, and we use these tools only for simulation part, not optimization. Uh, it, uh, it is very... Uh, useful as uh, GADMA uh, provides some common interface uh, before GADMA, it, uh, the researcher should choose, sh should uh, use different interface for daddy moments and other engines and so on. It was very difficult uh, for especially uh, biologists, for example. Uh, and as I said, we got some effective optimization based on the genetic algorithm, and it proved to be very efficient, as more efficient than uh, all optimizations that were implemented in Daddy and Moments uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, we got some nice results of, of this uh, uh, of its efficiency. Uh, the, we have uh, a little problem as uh, GADMA uh, handled up uh, two, three populations. Uh, I will explain on right now why it happens. Uh, but uh, so it's an open uh, source tool. And if you like, you can uh, try to find it. It has a very special name, so you can just Google it. Uh, and you will see a GitHub repository with some examples and so on. So if you are interested, you can check it out. Uh, why uh, GADMA handles up to three populations? Actually, it happens because uh, they will is a, a evaluation complexity of simulations. Uh, as we used uh, already uh, methods uh, already existed, uh, we had to deal with their complexity and complex complexity was exponential. Um, on, uh, on this slide, it's a little messy, but time is in log scale. So we can see several lines uh, that actually are exponential scaled uh, lines. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, we, we have to deal with these uh, expensive, expensive evaluations. Uh, and for three populations, we, a genetic algorithm was quite good, but for four and five populations, it was very, very slow. And we want to, uh, 
to include this uh, number of populations to guide more also. So here is when Bayesian optimization appears, uh, and at this time Slava was uh, uh, doing uh, some research on uh, uh, Gaussian processes and Bayesian optimization, and uh, he recommended me to take a look, and actually it was very great. So. Uh, Slava and Iskander also uh, already told some uh, introduction to waste optimization and Gaussian process already, but I have some slides and I, I try to move fast uh, through them. Uh, but the goal of waste optimization is to minimize some unknown function uh, in a few evaluations as possible. Mm, and uh, it is usually, usually used when we have black box optimization, so we don't know our function and can't uh, calculate some uh, gra uh, gradient uh, from that. And another very uh, mm, that we, we should remember, it is that Bayesian optimization is effective when our evaluations are expensive. When they are not expensive, uh, there are some other uh, optimization algorithms that are more efficient. Uh, so, Bayesian optimization is such that on each iteration, we approximate our uh, function with some surrogate model, uh, and then we choose next point as some uh, arg maximum uh, point of acquisition function. Uh, and uh, if we take a look to some picture how Bayesian optimization works. Uh, black points are our observation of our uh, target function, of our objective function. Uh, blue line is our predict, prediction of our surrogate model, and the blue area around this line is some uncertainty. Uh, the red line is acquisition function that is somehow built, and we on each iteration we found our maximum that is right here. Uh, and uh, add this point to our observations and evaluate our target function there. So we add this point, our model changed, our acquisition function changed, and we find next maximum. And so on, it happens. Uh, and we can see that waste optimization is some trade off between. Uh, uh, exploitation and exploration. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the acquisition function is very cheap to optimize. Uh, so we uh, actually change the optimization of our target function to optimization of acquisition function. Uh, and also the model that is built, surrogate model, usually takes some time to build, uh, to approximate. And that's why Bayesian optimization slows down uh, during iterations. Uh, so what uh, is used for surrogate model? The first one is already told uh, Gaussian process, uh, and it is uh, very popular, very easy, mm, not easy, but very popular. Uh, another uh, example that I met uh, during um, the research, it was random forest. And uh, this is uh, this, uh, this is different models for the same observations. And we can see that uh, random forest uh, is uh, somewhat strange, uh, but the advantage of it is that uh, random forest is much faster than Gaussian process. Uh, but from my experience, random forest is not very good as uh, a Gaussian process. So, we will use Gaussian process. Um, Gaussian process uh, is a random function uh, uh, such that if we have some input, uh, uh, then the output vector will be a uh, multivariate Gaussian vector. And uh, Gaussian process is uh, characterized by, oh, sorry, by mean function and covariance function that is called kernel. 
uh, kernel is uh, covariance function is usually on practice it is choosed from uh, some uh, modern kernels uh, and uh, they looks like that uh, and they have some parameters like variance length scale and smoothness uh, the first two are uh, can be found uh, from from the data the, from observations that we have and the last one is usually fixed and when it is fixed then we got some different kernels uh, and when it uh, it is uh, the infinity then it recovers some uh, squared exponential kernel uh, so if we sample from gaussian processes uh, with different smoothness values then we got uh, somewhat kernels like that for uh one uh divide well one four for the half uh of smoothness we got exponential kernel uh for three divided to two it will be called matern three two then matern five two the same a thing and the last one uh the, maybe the most popular case is when uh, we have uh, smoothness equal to infinity it is called rbf kernel and it will be a look like that uh, so it is four kernels that we tried to uh, apply for in our case for our uh, Bayesian optimization for our Gaussian processes uh, so we will see them a little later but uh, we used uh, four uh, kernels uh, like that another uh, thing from Bayesian optimization is acquisition function uh, and uh, there are also some classical choices of acquisition function the first uh, it will be drawn on the right uh, each of them the first one is expected improvement uh, and uh, it will be for this model it will be something like that then uh, probability of improvement uh, it is a little shapey uh, then uh, the lower confidence bound uh, and it, it is very easy uh, to to see that it is just our lower confidence bound uh, and the last one that is not very popular but uh, it happened to uh, that I uh, find it it is a log transformed expected improvement that uh, assume that our uh, function is uh, that we not have a Gaussian process but we have a log transform Gaussian process and uh, if we assume that and take our expected improvement it also will have like all of these functions they will have very nice representations for gaussian processes it will be easy to uh, calculate them uh, so for our experiments uh, actually we used uh, expected improvement probability of improvement and log transform expect improvement uh, but we missed lower confidence bound maybe we will cover this acquisition function in future but uh, the results that we have right now are also very good so we just stopped on these three acquisition functions uh, the thing uh, about how to choose uh, the kernel for Bayesian for Gaussian process is uh, like a little separate problem, but there is uh, one uh, solution that is called cross validation. It is very common technique for some for machine learning, uh, but uh, we will use it. So I uh, put it here. It is the last slide about Bayesian optimization. Uh, so we for we have our training cases uh, x y and y i that is actually a function f on x i uh, then if we uh, leave uh, out one training case then we can evaluate uh, the uh, predictive log probability as log of density to observe uh, why I in condition of our model uh, and it will be somewhat of that and then we can uh, evaluate some 
cross validation score for each model that we have, each model of Gaussian process. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, and. Uh, it will be called, uh, this cross-validation will be called leave one out as we uh, leave on, for each uh, case, we will leave one training case. And then we just summarize these uh, predictive log probabilities together and got some uh, log predictive probability that is for our cross-validation overall. Uh, and uh, yeah, so move forward to uh, to our application uh, of Bayesian optimization for demographic inference. And uh, first, we will start from data sets that we have got, as uh, there will be uh, some names, uh, and I want you to uh, understand what this name stands for. Um, if we have such demographic uh, model, uh, it has some parameters, and uh, for this model, uh, the data set will have name, for example, like that. Uh, the first number is for population number. The second part is just a string uh, with some short description, and it will make sense for me, but not for you. But Mm, it will be on slides. Uh, then uh, the, the second number uh, well, next to the last uh, part is parameter numbers. So uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, sorry, six. Ah, no, well, this one is the same. So one, two, three, four, five parameters. And it is pictured here. And the last three uh, symbols are for source of uh, the data, the source of our summary statistics, uh, as uh, it can be f some somewhat simulated or from some paper, then uh, the first or the, the letters of first author of this paper will be uh, put it here. Um, so if we measure against our data sets, evaluations of our data sets, and we, we will got some picture like that. Uh, actually, we got a lot of data sets. They were like 20 of them. But for this presentation, I narrowed it down just to, to <laughs> not to be scared a lot. Uh, and again, the time is log uh, transformed. And we see that for two populations, uh, the time of evaluation is very uh, fast. Uh, for three population, uh, populations, it is uh, somewhat uh, more uh, slower. But for four and five populations, it is, it is much slower. And actually, we will uh, we at the beginning we understand that for two populations based optimization is not very good choice uh, and also there is one population missed here but uh, if you have it and it is also faster than two populations so this part is very good for genetic algorithm and we leave it uh, as it is and the four three populations, our genetic algorithm works fine, but maybe Bayesian optimization will uh, perform better. We don't know. And uh, we target our Bayesian optimization, especially for four and five populations here, as genetic algorithm was very slow. Uh, so we performed cross-validation to, to understand what kernel uh, we should choose for our Bayesian optimization, for Gaussian process and Bayesian optimization. We uh, make cross-validation and we got some, well, I, I said a lot of data sets, but uh, what we can see is that exponential kernel is a very bad choice uh, for all data sets except one. <laughs> uh, and we don't know why it is uh, this this data set, it just uh, showed like that. Uh, and uh, what about the best choice of kernel? Uh, it uh, differs, uh, it may be Matern 5.2 or RBF, uh, but if we take a look for four populations, we will, uh, yeah, for, for here. So we probably say that it will be not RBF, RBF uh, poorly. Uh, but as I, I launched a lot of Bayesian optimization after, after cross-validation and checked out uh, if this table, this cross-validation score are 
true, uh, then uh, no, they give us not a lot of information about uh, how this kernel would uh, will, will perform on practice. We just got such results. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I told, uh, I, I forgot to tell that uh, for cross validation, we used like 2000 points uh, and it was a lot of points for Gaussian process and, but uh, still it doesn't work very well. Uh, and then, so we uh, got, we, we took uh, four kernels and three uh, acquisition functions and uh, launch uh, like 12 Bayesian optimizations and build uh, convergence plots for all our cases and got the mess like that. Um, and then we try to understand what we can see here. Uh, on uh, X axis here is iterations. We launch all Bayesian optimizations uh, up to 200 uh, iterations or evaluations. Uh, and uh, on Y axis, there is a minus distance to optimal value of log likelihood. So the higher our curve of convergence is, then it is better. Um, and uh, the solid lines are our median uh, of uh, 64 launches, and the area around is uh, the area between 25 and 75 quantiles. Uh, so what we we take a look at a lot of uh, these pictures and saw some bad convergence. The first uh, thing that I wanted to show is that the uh, green area that uh, was corresponding to expected improvement acquisition function uh, performed poorly in all uh, data sets that we uh, uh, made uh, experiments. Another thing that uh, is important that exponential kernel worked performed poorly also, and uh, we can just uh, say that exponential kernel and expected improvement are very bad choices for our problem. Okay, another thing that is not uh, seen here, but uh, Matern uh, 3.2 uh, is worse than Matern 5.2. So we got, uh, we remove all our pictures, uh, all our lines, and saw some mess like that. And from uh, these four uh, results, we can't choose which one is the best. So then we tried to remember cross-validation, but we applied it uh, somewhat different. And we decided that uh, let uh, cross-validation to choose kernel at the beginning of uh, our optimization right after initial design. And uh, we got uh, two different acquisition functions, uh, log expected improvement and probability of improvement. Now, it is uh, different Gaussian kernels, uh, Gaussian processes. Uh, so uh, we got like two uh, results uh, from that. And uh, again, there was no clear choice of uh, the best uh, optimization. That's why we made some assembly of these two and based on optimization on each iteration, choiced randomly for what acquisition function to choose, log expected improvement or probability improvement. And we got our great results. Yay. Uh, finally, we got some uh, very nice um, picture. And uh, here is another example for another data set. It's uh, not very, it's, it's uh, also good. Uh, and uh, the last part is how to compare based optimization with genetic algorithm. So like the main part maybe. Uh, and uh, if we put a genetic algorithm, also random search just to be sure that uh, everything is uh, okay. And based optimization for 200 iterations. We see that Bayesian optimization is cool. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, there is some uh, additional uh, time for Bayesian optimization to work. So we should check wall clock time. Uh, and when we check it for three populations, it looks like that. 
we see that uh, Bayesian optimization is uh, actually equal to genetic algorithm. Uh, another um, data set for three populations was uh, pretty much the same. So uh, for three populations, there is no uh, difference between Bayesian optimization and genetic algorithm. For four populations, there is some uh, good uh, convergence for Bayesian optimization at the beginning. Uh, and if we take for five population, take a look, then we see a huge, uh, oh, oh, huge convergence of Bayesian optimization. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we uh, show that performance on practice of Bayesian optimization depends on kernel and acquisition function uh, selection. Uh, and uh, leave one out cross validation works poor if we choose uh, from large, a large uh, random um, data set of points, but uh, it uh, works pretty good for automatic kernel selection at the beginning of Bayesian optimization. Uh, and if uh, we uh, compare Bayesian optimization with the NCK algorithm, that, then we will get some great results for three, for four and five populations. Uh, and for future work, we uh, want to combine, we, we uh, need to understand if uh, we want to combine Bayesian optimization with genetic algorithm, or we just uh, need to use them separately, but we should check it out. And also we should uh, like uh, think about a stop criteria for Bayesian optimization as now it was stopped after 200 uh, iterations. It's not very good. Uh, to do. Um, and we also need more experiments to uh, on uh, including real data uh, as almost uh, uh, all data sets that we used right now were for, for, were for simulations. And I want to thank Slava and my colleagues from Itmo University, Pyle de Brin and Vladimir Lyantsev. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>